And you're welcome to the RT Rugby Podcast as Toulouse are crowned champions of Europe for a record fifth time. Leinster have gone close, of course, uh, to that coveted fifth star over the past few years, but it is the French aristocrats that have become the first side to do it on Saturday with a 22-17 win against La Rochelle. Delighted to be joined by Donald Lennon and Johnny Holland on our last podcast of the regular season. And I guess, Donald, look, you can't deny to lose that five-star uh, honour, really. Um, as the aristocrats of, of both French and European rugby, you have to say, it's, it's not the worst thing that they have managed to become the first side to, re- to reach that five. No, look, uh, I suppose I've been following Toulouse for a long time. I go right back to the, the start of the Heineken Cup 25 years ago. Uh, they won the initial trophy. I was there in the uh, Stade Arnaz Villan when they put 60 points on Munster about two years later. And uh, I remember going into that dressing room thinking, oh my God, like this European Cup, no Irish side will ever have a chance. And, and you know, within three years, Munster were beating Toulouse down in Bordeaux in a, in a famous semi final. Uh, obviously, the Irish provinces eventually got hold with the, the challenge of Europe. But uh, Toulouse, I suppose, they've been ever present, albeit just 11 years since they, um, since they won the Heineken Cup. I was actually at the last final they were in in 2010. Uh, the ERC was celebrating 15 years of European rugby at that stage. So we had a fantastic weekend in Paris. I was part of a selection group that uh, picked the team of the first 15 years. Uh, O'Gara got the player of the first 15 years, um, which was a bit poignant, actually. I remember, um, you know, looking at the final, uh, which was uh, Biritz and uh, Toulouse in uh, the Stade de France. And uh, I remember spending, Anthony Foley had been selected as number eight wow. on that uh, and that first 15 years of European rugby. And I remember having a good few points with Axel at the match and after the match. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, at the conclusion of the game, Anton Dupont, we saw he got the Anthony Foley player of the tournament. Uh, so it was a bit poignant, uh, you know, looking back on that. And um, uh, you have to say Dupont thoroughly deserving of his honour. But as tends to happen in finals, and especially all French affairs, it really wasn't a great affair. It was, um, uh, you know, disappointing in some respects, but I'm sure... Toulouse won't be worried about that when they got back to the, the famous square in the, the middle of Toulouse and late on Saturday night. Yeah, I'm sure they won't, Johnny. You know, but uh, just to pick up what McDonald has just mentioned there, finals are funny in ways, aren't they? You know, because you, know, you, you build all season through a cracking tournament of which we've seen brilliant games of rugby, fantastic tries, right across from the start through the group stages and the quarterfinals and knockout stages as well. And you get to the final... And ultimately, you're left with two teams who, who are desperate to win it. And that desperation sometimes leads to what we got on Saturday, which is a bit of a, a touchy, nervy, edgy affair. And the best rugby sometimes uh, falls by the wayside as a consequence. Yeah, it does. And I was, I was kind of looking over the, the past finals last week, just the results and, you know, finalists themselves. And if you look at it, they're always the, the powerhouses of that year. Like, they're always the big packs. You know, this year, obviously, French rugby has gone very well. You get two big packs going at it. And it does, it ends up being a stalemate, I suppose. The power matches the power, and that's where we probably see the likes of Munster at the moment aren't matching that power, and they fall out of that tournament a little bit early. Like So then you get the two most powerful sides that have a bit of flair in their back line alongside it, or a good control at half-back, and they, they nearly match each other for control, match each other for power. And, and you know, I'd love to say that the final was um, a matching of power, but I think it was a matching of errors for the first 25, 30 minutes at least, until we saw that red card, and... Um, you know, you're looking at it and I find it hard as well. You know, I, if I ever miss the Carcon game and I'm trying to look back, or even when I'm trying to look back anyway, and I'm analysing it not on the pitch, you try to remember what the conditions are like because you'll take a different approach to how you analyse it. Same thing when you're watching on TV. I think it's very it's very easy to kind of go, oh, they're playing brutal rugby and why isn't he holding on to that one? But then Sam Warbling comes on to uh, the commentary and, and kind of describes the... Uh, the conditions pitch side and how hard it is to hold on to the ball and you kind of have to realise that as well but these are the best teams in Europe at the time and you do expect them to do a little bit more you know it was nearly a, I was writing notes as I watched the game you know and yeah. it was kind of like oh mistake turnover two phases mistake turnover and it, it was shocking to watch in the first 25 minutes but at the same time I suppose it brought the excitement at least it it came to a crescendo at the end and you had Intermac nearly running away for his life trying to get the ball off the pitch like so there was there was excitement there was a red card it didn't ruin the game, but it, you know, it was a massive talking point. I think credit to La Rochelle, they, they really stood up with Batia off the pitch. But I think there was probably an error in hindsight on, on selecting him as well, you know, because 
Do you think he wasn't fit, Johnny? Do you think he wasn't fit? Do you think that they should have left him out? And I, I, like I'm asking this in the, in the context of the season that he has had, how important he's been for La Rochelle. Just this far, he's been a huge player for them. Um, do you think it was a mistake to pick him? I think there's a lot of uh, experience in John O'Gibbs and obviously Raj is becoming much more experienced now and they know their team inside out. And obviously he is that focal point for them in the midfield. You know, like he's, he's a the physicality to the game. So it's very easy for me to say he was undercooked and two weeks is too long out of the game in hindsight. But I think if you're looking at that and he's presenting at training ready to go-ish, I think you you strap that ankle and, and you try to get him on with it because yeah. we've seen that and we've seen that a load of times before and fellas get through it and you know Roger would have said in an interview that I heard during the week that his timing was out and he hit him high and he accepted it for what it was which is very honest of him to say that there was possibly a, a management issue in that as well but like to be honest I think a guy like him to La Rochelle you select him and you hope for the best it didn't go their way that's the way it happens you know so I wouldn't I wouldn't go back and not select him based on that. I'd say mm. select him again if you, if you had your choice again, you know. You'd probably select him again, Donald, or probably say, would you ever calm down and not absolutely stuff Maxime Medard and nearly take his head off? That'd be the instructions you'd say to give to him. <laughs> well, that's the way he plays. You know? yeah. I mean, he's just an, he's an unbelievable player. He's played in the back row for Fiji. Uh, he's so brilliant over the ball. It's like having two players in one. Uh, and you can see, you know, he's obviously a key figure in that La Rochelle camp. He's been with them for a long time. He's been there in the good days and the bad days. Mm. And sport is littered with uh, uh, selection decisions that with the benefit of hindsight you may not have made. But that's the beauty of sport. Uh, you're sitting there on the Thursday, the Friday. Uh, you have a decision. You're the coach. You rattle it in your head. You discuss it with people you trust. You talk to the player himself. He assures you he's 100% right. Um and look, maybe maybe it was a factor in the incident. There's no question that the, the specific incident was a red card. Uh, in fact, I was amazed when the yellow came out first. Um, I said, geez, he's really getting away with one here. But, um, yeah. you know, obviously there's so many cameras. The TMO obviously had a, a word in, in, in Pierce's ear uh, and it was changed to a red card. Even, look, Ronan, he doesn't dispute that it was a red card. Um, but look, in terms of the... It obviously was a hugely significant moment. You'd have to think, given how tight it was at the end, given that they missed two penalties and a conversion, um, you know, that, you know, if La Rochelle had 15 players, they might have won it. And, uh, you know, I think I said on that in previous weeks, I, I saw Toulouse live against Munster and I wasn't hugely, I wasn't overly impressed by them. I did think they weren't quite as good as Toulouse teams of, the, of, of let's say, the previous winning teams. Um, but, what they have is halfbacks, Dupont and, and Entomac, and Johnny kind of intimated uh, to it there. You go back at all the winning teams over the years, what they do have is a presence and a dominance at halfback. No, La Rochelle had that as well, but unfortunately West missed two penalties and a conversion that, that proved uh, hugely uh, critical. Um, but if you look, uh, I mean, I was looking back, uh, I did have a fear coming into the final. Two French teams, they tend not to play against each other. Yeah. Uh, you go back to the quarterfinal. Bordeaux, Racing, 24-21, no try. Say, the other quarterfinal, Clermont, Toulouse, 12-21, no try. And Toulouse, Bordeaux in the semi-final, uh, Toulouse got a try in the fifth minute and they didn't get another try until the 71st minute. Mm. So they tend to be sort of slugfests of games, which is a bit disappointing. Um, but look, that, that's the way they are. And I thought, again, there was a couple of contentious calls by the referee. Certainly the one, uh, I don't know what you thought, Johnny, of the, the, the penalty against Skelton. I mean, Jesus, he's a big man. Uh, the one with Medard. I mean, the kick. You're entitled to stand your ground. You don't have to get out of the way of somebody running uh, in your line of path. Uh, but he didn't veer. He didn't stick out his shoulder. Um, and I thought that penalty was crucial at a crucial time in the game. This was en Entomax chip over the top and Skelton standing his ground and he ran into him and dived like a football player. That, that, yeah. that I thought, thought that was horrendous. Yeah, that's I the mean, one. Like, you have it in one. Yeah, yeah Johnny, I mean, what, what did you make of that? I just thought, what are we at here? I mean, if a guy can't even stand his ground anymore without someone throwing himself into him like, I don't know, like Neymar on a football pitch. Anyway, what did you make of it? Penalty to feel that every time. Um, <laughs> yeah, you would say that. <laughs> no, I, I do think, like, when I look back at it, I didn't see the incident in, when it was live because he was saying advantage from another penalty. So they were going to get a penalty regardless, just not in as advantageous a, a position, I would think. Um, and then when I saw it, Will Skelton, it was a real basketball move, like, made the first step and then stood there really like a statue, like a hard man to get around. But I think, you know, you could do, you could do better to get around him. But, you know, the, 
the one thing I was thinking of when you said it was a, a massive letdown was um, Cheslin Colby, like obviously won the World Cup, was unbelievable in the World Cup and all the excitement is around him in, the, in, in Europe as well. And I think he, he made a comment during the week that he was more nervous about this because he really wanted to win the European competition. And I was kind of just watching him all game to see when he was going to break free. And he didn't really break free. And I think I saw possibly, I was, I was looking at it too closely, but there was one stage, I can't remember what mistake he made or the ball just didn't get to him. And it looked like there was just frustration. He just wanted to be let out of the traps, you know, and it just looked like a game that he wasn't going to get away from anyone. And I, I think that kind of nearly summed it up for me. There was frustration in the way that the rugby was played, but... Obviously, they got away with it in the end. They, they took their win. You see them on, on, on the shoulders of someone else lifting the cup, and, and they're all delighted afterwards. But I think if you finals are like that, like if you come out the other side of it, you just kind of have to park it easier than what you would in another game, and you go off and celebrate Joe Tacori with the, with the corner flag, and you do mad things. But I think it's uh, finals are massively frustrating games, no matter what side of the game you come out of it. I think when you win it, you just kind of park it a little bit easier, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I know Ron Rogara has spoken on. And you talk of how frustrating he found, I guess, the game itself, Donald. And equally, you know, I was thinking to myself, do we just have to allow for two-hour matches from now on? The referees and the TMOs and the assistant referees were just having conferences that lasted minute upon minute upon minute. I think Wayne Barnes interjected every 10 seconds into the game into Luke Pierce's ear. Equally as well, quite how Maxi Midar wasn't deemed, you know, bad enough to go off for a HIA after that tackle from Bottia. You know, five minutes later, he sent. I mean, it does the whole again. The, the officials dominating the post-match kind of breakdown where decisions were made that were not made. You know, the time it took to get there. It's getting very frustrating. We've spoken a lot about the podcast here. I don't know what can be done to be honest with you. Yeah, well, look again. It, it, it comes back to all the protocol surrounding the the, the officials now, and you see there's so many officials involved in it. Uh, uh, look, it's getting boring talking about it at this stage. Yeah, we know from matches even. You know, the poor old fellas on the panel now after the match, because the game is taking two hours, they might be lucky to get five words in at the end of the game. Um, it just goes on forever. But um, no, look, it was, it, was, it was disappointing from that point of view. Uh, I also felt, look, a, a, a crucial point for me. I didn't realise that he was suspended. Uh, Julien Marchand, the captain of Toulouse, the hooker, French hooker, I thought he was by far and away the outstanding uh, number two in the, in the Six Nations. Uh, he's up there for me in, in the top two in, in the world in terms of his influence and everything. So I think he was a huge loss to Toulouse just as their, their talismanic figure up front. Uh, on the other side of it, you see someone like Jerome Kaino probably playing his last, well, he'd be, he, 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 I think he's finishing up at the end of the season. Uh, it was a bit ironic, I thought. Uh, both himself and Victor Vito had been, <coughs> like Kaino, Vito, they'd been in the same New Zealand squads. They were both substituted at the same time. They were kind of walking off the pitch, looking at each other as if to say, geez, I know you. I've seen you somewhere <laughs> yeah. before. Um, you know, so you have, like, it's amazing what the, the European company has come. Two, two outstanding New Zealanders over in Europe, plying their trade in, in La Rochelle and Toulouse. Um, it's just a fantastic competition. Um, and I think actually the, the round of 16 thing, they might have fallen on a, and, a, and, a, and um, a formula that worked quite well this year. Uh, mm. And there's talk, I think, that it's going to be the same next year. Oh, great. Um, so that you might allow a few more teams into it. But um, because you might have, you know, you, you go to the round of 16 earlier, you don't have as many dead rubbers in the pool stages of it. Mm. Um, so I think that would be great. So what do you think, Don? I think yeah. that would be super. I think it'd be great. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Uh, sorry, Jenny. Yeah. No, sorry. I, I think it's uh, it adds, adds a bit of excitement to it as well, doesn't it? Like, and, and people, there's, there's more. Those knockout games are always what Europe's about, don't aren't they? And when you when you you, you kind of touched it yourself, when you look back, like you're talking about New Zealanders now coming in and uh, kind of being the stars of, and you know, Chesney Colby, South Africa being the star of uh, of the final potentially. I know he wasn't in hindsight, but when you think back to the more classic European games, you're thinking about the stars so the Toulouse. Um, team with, with all the French internationals like the Josie and Quattronos of the world it's got to change a small bit that the stars aren't all from the country that they're in but it's a, it's a class competition and I think the knockout stages of it are what make it so you're dead right I think they've, they've landed on something uh, that could work well going forward Donald I, I was not, just you know to give Toulouse their absolute credit here and, and this is uh, maybe in the context of, of where Leinster, Munster, Ulster, Connacht are at at the moment because again we generally tend to look inward here and say geez aren't we great until it actually becomes apparent that we're not so great. And I, I went down through the team there, just at the team that was involved at the weekend. 
Marshan, who you mentioned, Dupont, and Colby. Those three players you could own are you could argue are the best in the world at their position nearly at the moment, right? You can certainly make a strong argument for that. Then you throw in the likes of Enter Mac, who's as we know is a seriously talented player. Jerome Kine, who you mentioned, is still operating at a high level. You've got the likes of the Arnolds with Fly, Fowl Marina in the front row, throw in Weinhardt Elstart in the back row. I mean, that is a Toulouse side, Donald, that literally is littered with top, top international quality players. And they have won the tournament, which I think is a fair reflection of the standard and the quality that you need to get to. And sometimes I think that when we look at our, the current makeup of the squad with Munster and Leinster and Conan and Ulster, you know, we have some good Irish players there. But, you know, in terms of the top international quality players that I've just mentioned, Irish rugby is lagging that little bit behind at the moment, is it not? Well, I think, <clears throat> yeah, look, we've definitely... Uh, we, we spoke about the weeks ago. I think we have taken a step backwards over the past two or three years. But I think what you're alluding to is uh, we are just lacking that little bit of you know stardust or gold dust, whatever you like to call it, that adds to the mix that you have. I mean, uh, I, I made the point in a column I did with the Examiner last week about you know, when you look at Leinster to their credit, the team that lost to La Rochelle, the starting fifteen were all Irish internationals. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think um, Scott Fardy was the only overseas non-Irish qualified player within their 23. And there's a lot to be said for that. But I think if you want to compete at the very highest level, at that club level in Europe, you know, you need just something different, something within, somebody within the group who brings something different. Uh, and I think Leinster um, needs something like that. I, I, I suggested in terms, despite the fact, you know, that they have, say, James Ryan, Ryan Bear, two brilliant young athletes who will be at the core of what Leinster will do for the next five, six, seven years. I think they would benefit from bringing in someone like Eben Estebet into the second row, a big, hard-nosed South African. Uh, I think it would make it... I, I think he'd bring on the likes of Ryan and Baird hugely. He just adds something different to the mix, something that I think is missing. Uh, and I think... Uh, you know, if you're a Stuart Lancaster or Leo Cullen sitting back in the cold light of day watching the final on television like we all were, mm. there must be some element of regret there because I think they would feel, seeing how maybe Toulouse and all the mistakes that Johnny alluded to in the opening half of the game, I think that they would feel, had they come up against that Toulouse side, that it was well within their compass to win that game. If they played La Rochelle again, it could be a totally different game. Um, but look, that's the way, that is the, the nature of competition of this nature. Once you get to the last four, four, there's very little between the teams. You need something to go right on the day. The fact that, uh, like I've no doubt, Ronan O'Gara, it'll be, he'll be scratching his head wondering what would the outcome have been had Bati and Nak got sent off after yeah. 28 minutes. It could well have been a different game. But that's, that's the nature of sport. Uh, you know, I do think the likes of Leinster given what the the production line and the number of players that they are producing at the moment, not only for Leinster, but if you look at Munster and you look at Connacht and Ulster, there's there's Leinster products, if you like, scattered all around the country. So in my view, they're entitled to um, cherry-pick one or two of the best players in the world, bring them into that mix, and I think, you know, uh, it, it would add so much more even sort of at the box office, if you want to say, going back to um, the RDS next year, hopefully crowds will be in, you know, having, say, imagine if it, not, not that they need it, but if a Chelsea and Colby join Leinster, could you imagine the, the buzz it would create for the young kids and well, all imagine that? Well, imagine the Tolman Park when, when Snyman eventually takes to the pitch for Munster and imagine what that is going to do in a big game. I know he had his, his brief interlude, but imagine the buzz around a tough, hardy second row for Munster. I mean, like, do you need any more to whet the appetite than that? Yeah, I mean, well, look, I mean, that was just such an unfortunate incident. Yeah, I was there that first game back, and yeah. I, right underneath me in the stand, just uh, you knew the minute he hit the ground after that line out that there was something serious that happened. It was almost written in the stars that this guy, who is a game changer, mm. um, you know, that he's gone after seven minutes of action. But look, that's the way that that's the way it goes. But uh, um, you know, I think Munster, all, the four Irish province, like Ulster had a had a, had a good year, but a, a bit like the rest of them, when they got to the key moments, they were found wanting. I mean, I was really disappointed with the way they collapsed in the second half against Leicester in that uh, Challenge Cup semi-final. 
Now, when you look at the power that Montpellier brought in, it brought in the Challenge Cup final, I'm not quite sure that they'd have been able to match that had they got that far. I think Connacht, we've spoken about them a lot in the past couple of weeks. They've had a really, really good season. Uh, uh, Andy Friend has brought on so many good young players there. So, you know, I mean, I'd be quite excited about next season. Uh, I think the fact, hopefully, by December, we will have crowds back in Thoman Park, the RTS, and, and in Belfast and, and Galway, that the buzz that that will generate alone will lift everybody. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll have had a good Lions tour and that, you know, there's always a kind of a buzz. Uh, a good Lions tour, uh, finishing as it does in, in the start of August, kind of puts everybody kind of on their toes, looking forward to a new season again. Yeah. So, um, despite the fact that we're coming to the end of the year, we still have a lot of rugby ahead of us. We do. And, uh, d- d- you know, th- the fact that the Lions tour, Donald, is in South Africa, and Johnny, you can pick up on this one here, and the four South African sides are going to be joining the New Look Pro 16 next year. We're going to have all these South African brilliant players involved regularly, week in, week out, with the Irish provinces, with the Celtic League provinces. It's going to add to a huge amount of excitement. And I, for one, I can't wait for it, first of all, but it's badly, badly needed for a domestic league. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, I've been watching some of the South African sides. If, if I'm honest, I've been a bit disappointed by some of the quality of the play. Now, we know physically they're absolutely massive. Um, but I think they're lacking. When you consider, I think South Africa at the moment, there's something, uh, there's over 250 South African players playing professional rugby overseas at the moment. You take that amount of players out of your domestic game. Wow. Uh, it's bound to have an impact on the quality that you've left at home. But I think what will happen, and I know this is Razi Erasmus's long-term plan, by getting involved in Europe, the next stage of Pro 14 is that those South African provinces, at least one or two of them, will qualify for the Heineken Cup. So therefore, yeah. his long-term view is to get the South Africans that are overseas, get the best of them back in South Africa. That's going to lift the quality of those teams. Uh, and overall, I think you know we have the potential both on Pro 16 and on the European Cup to have two brilliant tournaments. The, the biggest factor in terms of the introduction of the South African teams next season, there's, there's two elements. Number one is increased physicality, which I think we're all agreed that our Irish teams, our Irish provinces need to be exposed to that more because in many of, in many, like our, the, our provinces are the bullies in the Pro 14. And then we go into the knockout stage of Europe and we're on the receiving end of it. So I think the South Africans will give us more exposure there as long as our frontline players are playing against them uh, 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 every second week. Yeah. The second thing that will be a major factor is just the actual the, 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 the conditions that you're playing in. Mm. Playing down in South Africa in January, February. In, and if you're in, if you're in Loftus, Versfeld in Pretoria, if you're in in Ellis Park, um, in, 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 in Johannesburg. It's completely different to what you'll have experienced. Then you have the weather factor. I mean, some of the games will be played in 28, 30 degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw a comment there by um, uh, Jacques Ninarber. He was talking, it was one of the, the, the Pro 14 games over Christmas where he could see the Irish players shaking in the cold. And he was, oh my God, he says, what are our fellas going to be like when they have to go up? <laughs> To the sports crowd in Galway on a, on, a, on a Saturday night in January or February. So you have that element that will come into it as well. But I think that's brilliant. It'll add to the mix. It'll add to it. Give us something different because let's be honest, some of the games in the Pro 14 have been off. Yeah, exactly. And, and I tell you, you're going to have a lot of you're going to have a lot of South African lads going to their doctors looking for sick notes in January coming to the sports crowd in Galway, Johnny Hall. But look, you know, well, I tell you one thing, you we won't be taking we won't be taking any sick notes when it comes to if we're invited to South Africa to any match available, ready to travel, no yeah. sick notes. The, the problem is our end is going to be get us to try to come back. Sorry, lads, we're not coming back. We're staying down here, Johnny. I mean, look, it, it, it is going to be great for the competition, and I hope that the South African sides give us the quality of competition that we need that has been missing so far. And with the players that they have, albeit Donald said, look, the quality hasn't been great from what we've seen. I think we have to give them a pass this season because of COVID and because of the lack of game time. And the, I guess, you know, they just haven't really had much match practice, really, that next year they'll hit the ground running and we're going to, uh, we're going to have a really good season ahead. Yeah, hopefully. Like, it definitely adds a different dynamic. And Donald's touching a lot of it there where you're going into physical games and you're just not ready for it because you're dominating, I suppose, squads in, in Wales and, and Scotland that... You know, they're not able to play their front-line players as often as, not as often as what Irish 
squads do, but the Irish squads are probably bigger and um, and they just can't compete, I suppose. So it's, it's very good for the Irish provinces. I suppose it's good for the league in general just to freshen things up a small bit. And I know when, you know, I had retired and I was looking at this South African trip and you're kind of going, how lucky are they? Like, you know, it's just kind of after breaking up your year. And, you know, it's not about people will be listening and kind of saying, these are professional players, like go and play a game and get on with it. But at the same time, I think it's a, it's a long season. It's very tough. And the fellas who get to go to South Africa, you know, I know that first year they went, they stayed for a week in between the two matches and, you know, it was like a, like a mini Lions tour and the fact that they got to go to the zoos and do, do a couple of things that they wouldn't be doing at home in the sun it just breaks up your whole winter. Like, and, you know, you said about going to the sports ground in, in January and February, I'd much prefer to be going to South Africa, you know. So I think it definitely, it adds a dynamic away from the rugby itself. It adds a dynamic in terms of squad and getting them together. It's not very nice when you're the one left at home, by the way. Um, I was left at home for an, an Italian trip when the two Italian teams were back-to-back yeah. uh, a couple of years Can I just tell you, sorry, Johnny, just to interlude there, when you go to Africa, you don't go to the zoo, you go on safari. You yeah, see the yeah, real thing. thing. Nothing behind yeah. bars. <laughs> yeah, as, long as, the, as, long, as long as the Irish lads don't do a Scott Baldwin on and put their hand in through the lion cage and get their bloody <laughs> yeah. fingers taken off of the thing. As long as they're, but no, look, it will. It'll, it'll add a whole, um, a whole new dimension to, to everything as well, which, which I think, I think it'll be great. Um, I, I love to just before we finish up, um, guys. I just I, I love to throw these bombs into the mix at very late notice and just get your reaction to things. So um, I asked both of you just before we came on air to pick a couple of younger players that you'd like to see maybe take the step up to the senior level next year in the provinces. It can be any province, any player that you'd like to see become a, a more permanent fixture when we come to the crunch and big important games. Who would you like to see take that step up, Donald? I'll ask you first. Is, is there anybody? In either kind of the younger statesmen in any of the provinces that you think, yeah, this kid, I'd love to see a bit more of him next year. Yeah, well, to be fairness, uh, to be fair to you, you always give us at least two minutes notice before you throw those bombshells. Uh, so in that, in that two minutes, uh, but look in the Munster with? context, I, I think Munster, given the way the game is going, they're crying out for an out and out seven. You know, you've been. Sort of playing a, a six and a half at seven. Peter Romani's played a lot there this year. Mm. Uh, Jack O'Donoghue's had a great year. Uh, uh, Jack O'Sullivan has played at seven. To me, they're all kind of six and a halves. Uh, John Hodnett is a fantastic young player from West Cork, playing with UCC. Um, was on that Irish 20 side that won the Grand Slam a couple of years ago. Uh, unfortunately, just when he was sort of feeling his way, uh, he... he you know, played in a couple of the Pro 14 games, got out of the match in one of them, I remember, and uh, was outstanding. Uh, he's been out for the whole season. Really like to, if he can come back and play at the level that he was at, and now he's had another, say, nine months of conditioning, uh, I think uh, he's going to be well worth following. Um, in Leinster, I think the, the, there's a battle happening at Hooker blowing down the road. Um, uh, uh, Ronan Keller, obviously, is the, the young incumbent there, but uh, she and the Hooker yeah. former, um, I, I saw him play for Trinity on a number of occasions. Uh, every time he plays for Leinster, he seems to score a try. He's, he's tall for a Hooker, he's six foot two or six foot three, but he just seems to add something different. Um, I, he has the uh, there's going to be a battle going on between himself and Kelleher for that number two shirt in Leinster over the next number of years. That'll be really fascinating. And the last one for me, I'm sticking with the forwards, Johnny, so I hope you have a few backs. Uh, obviously, again, from a second row perspective, Thomas Ahern is a player, I think, massive athleticism, six foot nine. Again, unfortunately, I think he, he got injured at the wrong time, would have got a couple of games for Munster in this phase of the, the Pro 14 season. Um but the fact that, uh, you know, he, he could learn so much from the Snymans of this world, uh, he brings something different. He just, you know, we know he, he's played in the back three until he was 17 years of age. Again, we saw him play for Ireland uh, at Irish under 20 level. And just his ability to offload. He, uh, he, he, all the primary functions of a second row he can do. I mean, he's a, obviously a very productive line out operator. He's a good scrummager. But the things that he adds, it's the X factor things that he adds, I think, uh, is, 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 could make him a special player. And I look forward to seeing how he's going to develop next season. Lovely. So we have um, Tom O'Hearn, John Hodnett, and then the battle at Hooker as well between Sheehan and Kelleher for Leinster. And, and hopefully we'll see um, at least some or not all three of those get a, a big push for next season. Johnny, who are you excited about seeing potentially next year? 
You know, I think there, there's actually excitement on two levels. I think the the group that are just before, just below international level, I think you've got a load of these guys who are waiting to step up, and, and that's an exciting one in itself. But if you look past those and, and go to the level that are maybe looking to get some, um, you know, league experience or more league experience, I think there's a good chunk in there as well. Like, I'd, I'd look at Connor Fitz in, in Connacht, and he played really well the last day. I think he played quite well the last couple of weeks, but I, I'd love to see him now step up into... Um, more and more big games because I want to really see what he's worked. Like he was, he was in Munster when I was there, and uh, and obviously his brother Stephen retired during the week uh, last week maybe. Um, so there's a lot of rugby in their family, and I, I just want to see how far he can push his career because he's an exciting player. Very kind of um, just kind of goes under the radar at small, but he's got all the skills and and he he didn't he wasn't afraid to back himself either and kind of t- taking his try against Munster. So there's that. But similarly, there's an out half in Munster, Jack Crowley. He's been a con with us. Yes. So I'm, sli- so I'm slightly biased. Um, <laughs> Oh, I'm delighted you said him. I'm delighted you said him. I think he's brilliant. Go on, yeah. He's, he's absolutely brilliant. And I think he's got all the he's got all the attributes. We just need to see it all in one now and come out in games and control the game um, like he can um, and like you've seen him do it at, at underage level. But I think it's just going to take games. Like, you know, we, uh, I look at these fellas and I go, how are they getting games at their age? Like, we didn't get it. Maybe we weren't good enough. <laughs> but it was like, you know, they're getting a lot of exposure to it and there's already massive excitement around Jack, so I, I hope he can get more games. I know there's a battle there. You nearly see Joey as a signing with the fact he's back from, from injury, and I know we're all excited enough about that. Then you've got Ben Healy, and you're looking at where can we squeeze these three out has in one position. But I think given a, a, some game time, um, he's got a lot of attributes that we'd like to see getting at the game line and all that. Um, Alex Kingdellen's another guy, massive excitement around him a Munster. Uh, but likewise, over I think Connacht are doing so well with their like we're used to Leinster having all these players coming through. You know, I think Ulster actually do develop players quite young. You look at Ethan McElroy on the wing, and um, they do have very exciting players. But if you look at the two lads that played and stepped up against Munster last week, Niall Murray and Keane Prendergast, physicality from them in the second half when when Munster actually just couldn't find a breakthrough with all their stars in their team. You know, they just couldn't get through. I know the weather might have changed or whatever happened, but like they couldn't break through that physicality. And some of these young guys actually stepped up quite well. So like. You know, I think there's there's a bit of excitement around Connacht and the fact that it's kind of gliding in again under that radar. Tom Daly possibly could be involved in the summer. Do you know these kind of fellas? Mm. Uh, Alex Hutton could he be involved in the summer? There's, there's guys that they're probably excited about getting onto an international scene, as Donald says, in that Lions uh, year. You get all the excitement of that uh, and seeing what the, the top, top guys do. And then all of a sudden you just get these kind of bolters into the international side and you'd hope that they can bring a little bit of excitement there as well. But from the younger side, I think from a Munster point of view, Tom O'Hearn, Donald, like you said, Alex Kandel and Jack Crowley, there's loads. Um, Niall Murray, Kim Brendergast, I'd be looking at those guys. Connor Fitz, they're all exciting me quite a bit in the international and the Interpro series. Mm-hmm. I want to see more of them in the um, possibly getting into Europe and, and just getting more game time in the league as well. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Well, um, I'm delighted you said Jack Crowley because I'm a massive fan of his and I, I'd love to see him <coughs> really push uh, Joey for that 10 spot at Munster and I know I don't know if I've said this on the podcast at all this season Donald but um, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of Harry Byrne I think he could be somebody to keep an eye on as well I'd like to see him maybe push through as well uh, for Leinster and, and kind of get more runs at 10 more consistently so um, they'd be my two for this season Yeah well it, 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 it'll be actually interesting from that point of view obviously Johnny Sexton isn't going on the Lions and there's no no point in, in playing Johnny Sexton against Japan or the USA over the over the summer. So we have two internationals in, in the Aviva in July. Like certainly Harry Byrne has to come into the equation for that. Uh, and it's a chance for Andy Farrell now to maybe uh, front, you know have a look at some of these younger players. But if you to, I mean, it's crazy to think of it, but uh, by the time we're back in, in, in the new season in September, we're only two years out from a World Cup again. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's that new cycle. It always starts, the cycle to the World Cup starts after the Lions Tour. You are that sort of two years out and you really have to be uh, focusing in on the squad. There's always, always an opportunity for a bolter to get into a World Cup squad in the season leading into that. But really, in terms of your core players, uh, you need to have a clear vision on who has the capacity to step up international rugby so that process is going to start from I would say from the summer now in those two games against Japan and, and the uh, the USA so uh, mm. yeah look there's huge opportunities for young players in Ireland and let's just hope they get the chance to show what they can do Absolutely there Hugh is um, you know like you're saying it, Donald, we are only two years out and you're thinking can Jack Crowley get a go can Harry Byrne get a go 
you're still like there aren't that many internationals where fellas can have a cut. They're looking at Joey Carby needs game time. Ross Byrne needs to show that he's the guy to take that jersey. You know, so you kind of think we think about this very excitedly, and we kind of go, can they get international caps? Can they get more game time? And then all of a sudden you're going, well, Joey needs games definitely. Ross, I'm sure, wouldn't be saying, oh, leave me off because I've had a few. You know, so like it actually is very difficult to blend that, and you might get one. Or, I, I think that's when the the announcement of the squad is actually. I wouldn't say it's a letdown, but like you have to look at it pragmatically from the coach's point of view. They need a load of other guys to get game time while the Lions are away as well. Like, you know, Ryan Baird needs a load of game time, even though he's had a lot. He'll he'll grow into that. Like you're nearly talking about he's not a World Cup bowler, like, but he's he's the kind of guy that could nail on a starting spot by the time the World Cup comes around, you know. So they're the kind of kind of guys that you are thinking about. Maybe a Tom Daly will get in, maybe Alex Wooten will get in, Harry Byrne possibly, but the amount of players that are actually looking for that game time, it becomes very, very difficult to to know who to back for two years' time, you know. Yeah, I should say as well that Wes, when he, he, Wes couldn't be on the podcast this morning. He did send me the name of four young monster lads to keep out for for next season. But look, we'll come back to that, <laughs> back to that another time. So he couldn't be here. Look, my thanks to to Donald and to Johnny for today and for all season long as well to Bernard and to Wes who couldn't make the podcast this week. Um, but we will be back in some form or another with the Lions look as well ahead of the first test. So hopefully you can join us then. Thanks for your company throughout the whole season. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. We very much enjoyed bringing it to you. But for the moment, enjoy the summer, and we'll talk to you soon.